My name is Corey Skulth. I'm an associate director with Corporate Citizenship, where I work with uh, companies within the fashion industry and other industries on sustainability strategy and performance. Uh, and I lead our work in circular economy there. Um, and I'll just go around my screen and ask each of you to introduce yourself. Uh, Danielle, sure, I'll start with Danielle you. Danielle and Kojo. I'm the manager of Global Sustainable Products with Contour Brands, the parent company of Lee and Wrangler Jeans. Thank you. And Alice. Hi, uh, Alice Hartley. Um, I lead the product sustainability team at Gap Inc., um, which includes working with our brands on product sustainability strategies, um, as well as circularity and innovation opportunities. Thank you. And Samantha. Hi, I'm Sam Sims. I am VP of Environmental Sustainability and Product Stewardship at PVH. Um, a multinational apparel company that includes brands like Calvin Klein and Tommy Hilfiger as part of our portfolio. Um, and I'm responsible for sustainability across owned and operated supply chain and product, which has increasingly encompassed our work around circularity and our targets out to 2030. Wonderful. Thank you all three of you for joining us today. Really looking forward to hearing about the work that you're doing in this area. Um, so in the, the last session, we heard some really compelling visions for the future of the fashion industry, one where waste is completely designed out of the system, one where we can track our garments through infinite cycles and make sure we retain the highest value use of materials, and one where the, the food and fiber systems are integrated into a regenerative model that might sequester more carbon than it emits. Um, from your perspective, working in the very practical and concrete realms right now, what are you most excited about in terms of what you're working on now or what we might see coming from the industry in the near future? Um, and Alice, I'll start with uh, with you uh, to share some of the initiatives that all three of you are uh, part of. Sure, uh, there's a lot of exciting things going on. Um, and I think what is most exciting is that many of these reach across brands and it really goes to show that on issues of circularity, um, we need this collaborative approach. There's only so much that one company can do acting on its own. Um, so one great example of that, that all three of our brands are a part of is um, the Jeans Redesign Project, which is a project of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and their Make Fashion Circular initiative. Um, the challenge is to redesign a pair of denim jeans following the principles of circularity. Um, so design on for almost a year um, and the product is gonna be launching pretty soon. So over the next six months, you'll start seeing um, brands with their offerings in the market. Um, so for us, just speaking for Gap, uh, Gap Brand and Banana Republic who've been participating, um, it's been really galvanizing, I've found. Um, having this set of design guidelines, it's, it's freed up our teams um, to really focus on creating the solutions um, rather than have to spend a lot of time going around on, on defining the question in the first place. Um, so I think that's a good example of where having you know a common goal, um, everyone's gonna bring their different solutions to it, um, but we can all uh, to get engaged. Thank you. And Danielle, you've talked a bit about how the foundational commitments to sustainability are supporting your work in circularity along with um, your work in regenerative agriculture. Can you describe uh, where, where Contour Brands is working in those areas now? Yeah, so we re recently um, announced some of our updated goals um, for each brand. And our goals tend to surround, you know, our goals around our, our water commitment. Um, we've already been able to save about 7 billion gallons of water um, for our activity. So we've exceeded our 2020 goal and we're establishing um, some goals looking forward. And so as we're talking about sourcing our um, materials from sustainable sources um, and also looking at uh, making sure that we're using renewable energy at our uh, distribution facilities and uh, hopefully our production facilities. And so uh, our approach to setting these broader sustainability goals are setting a foundation for us looking at our products being truly circular to help us achieve those goals, particularly around issues like water and regenerative agriculture. Thank you. Um, and Sam, you've mentioned a few different areas where PVH is working in relation to circularity. What's most exciting to you right now? Sure. Um, so I'll say a, a few things. One, just on the, the Jeans Redesign Project, um, I think to add to what Alice said, our Tommy Hilfiger brand is also engaged in that. 
And uh, through that project, I think what's really exciting is it's also engaging manufacturers and other actors into the conversation. Um, additionally, it's underscoring the needs where there's, there's so many needs for innovation um, to be scaled um, and accessible, but where those kind of, where some of the greatest needs are. And so one of our big focus areas um, across the value chain right now is looking at chemical recycling and digging into that more um, and we have an exciting project coming up. It's actually going to be announced on September 10th um, with Fashion for Good, which for those who aren't familiar, is a sustainable innovation incubator and platform for the fashion industry that we're fortunate to be members of. Um, but really leaning more into identifying and working through the chemical recycling technologies that have the real potential to scale and be a part of the solution for ultimately circular products that we eventually all want to get um, to customers, consumers. Thank you. Um, and shifting gears to, um, I find that in these contexts, we often really feel the pressure to talk about our successes, but we know that we're all facing a lot of the same hurdles and challenges too. Um, can each of you share, what are, what are some of the big hurdles that need to be overcome together as an industry in order to to make a, a big step forward towards circularity, whether in investment and in the way we're creating jobs, um, in the way that we're handling materials. Um, and Sam, we'll start uh, going back to you on that one. Sure. Um, so I think there is a myriad of challenges, but that's what keep this, keeps this space uh, exciting, of course. Um, I think three large barriers, which I view as really needing a cross section of stakeholders to address. Um, and there's a particular report from BCG and Fashion for Good that um, if you haven't seen it, it's um, financing the transformation to circularity, I'd really recommend. Um, but three that echo throughout that and other conversations are one, the industry is not set up like other industries like consumer packaged goods or tech where we have this infrastructure and kind of history and the structures and, and kind of inherent processes at this point to innovate. So building that muscle um, I think is something we're all working through uh, as an industry. Um, the second piece I think that's notable is the financing, which is uh, given the title of the report, there's a lot of information on that. The report calls out that 20 to $30 billion annually is what's needed to really drive a lot of innovations to scale. So continuing to work across sectors um, and engage other sectors like finance more, expose them more to the way the apparel industry works um, and and help to bridge the, the gaps between where there's financing need and where tech solutions are um, is a, a great and important need um, that we think about. And then third, I would just call out the, and it's all interrelated, right? Everything with circularity always kind of ends up there, but this the enabling that scalability piece. So, um, so for example, when you have a really interesting bio-based solution um, for a new fiber, there's a big runway initially from an R&D standpoint and the ability to get that over the hurdle or across the bridge to a scalable place. And really that bridge from just being a capsule collection to being available um, to consumers. Uh, those are some kind of just from a, a landscape like overarching hurdles um, that we're thinking about. But there's a ton more that I'm sure Danielle and Alice <laughs> can dig into. <laughs> Um, Alice, what would you say are the, the biggest challenges you're facing at GAP uh, and, and what does the industry need to um, tackle first um, in terms of that? Um, yeah, I really agree that it's time that we need to start moving from these pilot projects. There have been plenty of proof points and I think um, many brands have shown that if you invest the time to um, kind of handpick your supply chain, you can close the loop, it's possible. Um, it's just we need to unlock doing that at scale and making it um, more affordable, making it more accessible um, and actually creating marketplaces um, instead of just sort of unique connections. Um, so I think there's, there's two big challenges. Um, 
that we encounter. One is just purely technical. There's still some innovation challenges out there when it comes to circularity. Um, so to in the realm of chemical recycling, a good example of that is spandex. So um, uh, fabrics made with spandex uh, generally are very hard to impossible to recycle. Um, and so there's just some innovation needed to figure out how do we um, remove the spandex from that fabric so that we can harvest the fiber and reuse it. So um, to that end, we're involved in a, a research project uh, with HK Rita, the Hong Kong Research Institute of Textiles and Apparel, um, to specifically look at that challenge of removing spandex from blended fiber fabrics, um, as well as figuring out how to extract the uh, indigo color from denim so we can recycle that cotton. Um, so some of it is sort of fits in that innovation uh, bucket. Um, but then I think the maybe more intractable challenge is just that circularity has so many puzzle pieces that have to fit together at the same time. So synchronizing that change is what can be difficult. You're trying to um, intervene in textile collection systems, in business models, and then in the actual product design itself. Um, and so for a successful ecosystem to come together, we have to do a little bit of that sort of like all at the same time. Um, and, and that's what's challenging. So I think in situations like that, um, instead of you know getting paralyzed uh, by that dynamic, how do we figure out how to um, start with something that is achievable? Um, so I, th I think the filter of how do we start to design for recyclability, um, there's many more things uh, beyond recyclability that fall under the umbrella of, of circularity. But if we can just start doing that a little more effectively, um, start to speak a common language about what will our recyclers take? What do we have to do as product designers in order to make our products recyclable? Um, that would start to, to build some momentum. Um, so the one other uh, project I really love to plug is uh, Accelerating Circularity um, that is just setting up to do just that. So how do we start to accelerate um, things like standards and common language um, and the fundamental research that's needed to, um, to make that jump into having um, just a more functioning marketplace for these solutions. So um, that's a small collaboration that's come together in the last year. Thank you. So it sounds like one of the big challenges is just that we can't necessarily sequence these challenges. We need to be kind of taking steps uh, all across the system simultaneously to really bring it to scale. Um, Danielle, what are the biggest challenges from your perspective, um, either in your work at Contour or that you see in the industry as a whole um, more broadly? Yeah, I, I come to the, the fashion industry essentially from the municipal waste industry. And so I think about, you know, we as a municipality, we're responsible for kind of catching the waste, right? At the end of the system, the ones that fall through the system and don't cir circulate back up. And so, um, as Samantha mentioned, that there, you know you have to put together these puzzle pieces. And I think this has there hasn't been this tradition of industry of the fashion industry really partnering with municipalities. And so, when we talk about circularity, the municipalities are your collection systems. And so, you know, where everybody's excited and working on a, a compostable gene, right? But are people going to be able to put that in their municipal compost pile? And the prop, the answer right now is no. And so I think we have to bring players to the table that haven't traditionally been there. And certainly your municipal recycling systems, um, your government officials essentially have to be part of that conversation because they've been our collection infrastructure. They do a good job of it, but expanding to include textiles is going to require them to rethink their approach, uh, rethink their sorting mechanisms and, and their collection mechanisms. And I think they'll be an excellent partner. I just think they need to be at the table. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that because there, of all the ways that a consumer might try to recycle a garment, you know, we can do it in bits and pieces with a bin here and a bin there, but really getting municipalities behind is how we're going to drive scale on that. So I totally agree. Absolutely, absolutely. Points to to the need for real collaboration, not just within the industry and its supply chain, but outside um, and to make sure that we're we're designing not just for sort of an ideal circular system of the future, but for the systems that we have in place right now and, and how we can adapt totally. those alongside the industry. I think um, I'm based in Austin, Texas, where we have one of the few municipalities that's really working on textiles very in a very focused way, but it's absolutely a huge challenge um, to work that with, with the producers and consumers as well. Mm -hmm. And Samantha, you have to add to that Sorry, one. Corey, I didn't mean to um, no. jump in. 
Um, so I was just going to say, I think along those lines as well, when you look across, I always envisioned, especially when I was in an office, it would be wonderful to have one of those neon lights that you could like light up what part of the circle you were talking about to whom at the right point. And then eventually when you get it all lit up, you're in a good spot, maybe in my home office one day. But, um, but as we think about the other actors we need along those stages um, or along different impact areas, depending on the product we're looking at, I think another actor that's really valuable to note or that we can, there's other industries working on some of these issues like CPG working on plastics. So, um, you know, when we, if we're really trying to think holistically here, sometimes we get into conversations and we're talking about the product. If the packaging is left behind, you know, how do we really think comprehensively? Um, but I think looking at and leaning into collaborations with other industries like CPG as it relates to plastic packaging um, and trying to collaborate to, to share best practices, but really to find out what those solutions are and apply them. Um, there's a lot of opportunity there that um, that is to be tapped, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my next question is about you know, what individuals who are listening to this session, watching the session today, um, can take into their own lives, um, both as consumers of clothing and uh, potentially in, the, in their role in the fashion industry or in other industries. So starting from the consumer perspective, as, uh, as we're all in that category, regardless of where we work, um, what would you say is, is one thing that uh, we can each do in relation to the way that we value our clothes um, and the way that we kind of enable circularity? And Danielle, I'll start with you on this one. <laughs> My answer to this question, is, it's, I feel like it's a, always a little off, but I always say people should, should learn how to sew, right? Like I had to, I couldn't get out of middle school without making that apron with the pocket and that has been lost. And so we talk about some of the life skills that are needed um, in schools and we talk about STEM, but everyone forgets about something very practical, right? Like the, the skill of sewing. I think when people understand, you know, just simply sewing on a button, they start to appreciate the human element that is embedded in our clothing. And I think it will make people value it more and think more about whose hands have touched this garment that I'm wearing. You know, we all remember the sweater that our grandmother knit us, someone's grandmother somewhere, someone's aunt, someone's sister, someone's daughter, um, you know, most, most likely women are making those garments far away from us. Um, for, for lower wages than what I think it's important for us to start to value their work. Um, and so I think just learning how to sew as an individual, you will appreciate that folks are doing on our garments. Absolutely. Um, and Alice, what about you? What's uh, something that listeners can do right now to kind of move towards uh, uh, valuing our clothes and, uh, and developing a more circular approach to managing them? Yeah, I'd say the top thing is the mindset shift of starting to look at your closet in a different way. So I think as consumers, we can be starting to ask new questions that maybe we haven't really thought of um, to date. So things like, what's the cost per wear that I expect when I'm going to buy something new and add it into this closet? Um, and questions like, does it make sense for me to actually own this piece? Or should I be renting it? Should I buy it with the intent to resell it. So changing up our thinking about um, that curation process of what goes in your closet rather than just, you know, garment after garment that you acquire, um, that would be a mindset shift that would start to lead us down this path to um, different, more circular business models. Thank you. And Sam, what about you? Is there something that consumers can be doing right now? The ship. You guys made me think about all these things. I'll throw out three really quick ones. One, I think ask the brands that you love what they're doing, if it's not really clear. Um, hearing from consumers is invaluable. Uh, the second is, and I, I, because this is the audience it is, I, I would think that most folks on the, on the VC don't throw their clothes away. But I think it's in, in COVID, I've actually found my, my farmer's market because of what was going on in New York City, didn't have the place for textile recycling and for dropping it off anymore. So I've even, I have a huge pile that I try to figure out where to put it, but seek out those solutions. Um, and I, I'm finding word of mouth, especially in the US where sustainable purchasing trends have really increased over the last year, but not prior to that, just talking about it and putting it in social conversations 
I think you have influence with your friends um, more than sometimes we realize. Uh, so I think modeling in that way, not to shame people, but just to kind of be proud about the behavior. I think it has little mini levers of power there. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we have a few minutes le left. I want to try to tackle a few of the great questions that we're getting from the audience. Um, so we had a few people ask about how kind of environmental justice goals intersect with circularity and whether there are kind of articulated goals or commitments within each of your brands that connect um, environmental justice to your broader And I'll leave that open to whoever wants to jump in. <laughs> Connecting environmental justice. Oh, go ahead, Alice. Sure. I, I, uh, what comes to mind for me are uh, uh, two points in the overall life cycle of the product. I mean, first, in producing the clothing, um, the, the impacts that the fashion industry has, whether they are direct and in your face or if they're happening halfway across the world, there's real life human health impacts to things like air emissions, water quality. Um, I think the audience is probably familiar with many of those issues um, as they stand today. Um, but I think maybe what's less top of mind is where does that product go um, when we're done with it? Um, is it going into a landfill to generate methane emissions, uh, which further are you know, creating pollution and um, climate uh, problems for this coming generation? Um, or is can we harvest that same uh, material and, and turn it into jobs? So I think that there's um, there's economic dimensions of that. There's human health and livelihood um, impacts that um, follow from those choices we make. So where is that production happening? Under what conditions? And then you know, what sort of responsibility do we uh, try to take for our footprint? Thank you. Um, and we had another question on, uh, given the disruptions to global supply chains of COVID and the desire to, for job creation in North America as we focus on economic recovery, how do you see um, those impacting your supply chain strategies uh, and, and how will they that affect our ability to um, create circular systems either in a positive or negative way? That's a big question, but I, so I could dig, that's probably like a 25 minute alone conversation. I, I guess one thing I would throw out is um, we continue to increasingly just really try to focus on and listen to the consumer and what they're asking for. Um, and I think with that, we're hearing, um, and I think we've increasingly seen it documented and talked about that consumers are looking for more sustainable products. So I think as it relates to, I think hopefully I'm addressing the question related to circularity and continuing that, it's it's one of the trends that's accelerating and is not just going to be a trend, but it, I believe will be embedded for the long term. So um, I think we have to keep evaluating where the consumer's going and their needs um, to figure out how to respond. But we're seeing a lot of direction from the consumer around sustainable, even if they're not calling it circular, um, but more sustainable product, which is circular product. Yeah. And Alice or Danielle, anything to add to that piece either on sort of the COVID impacts the supply chain or the demand for circularity in that context? Yeah, I, I mean, I not so much around um, the supply chain demand, but um, I think we're just really rethinking, right? As I think Samantha mentioned, right? The pile of clothes that we now have that we haven't worn in months and we're really starting to rethink um, how we can make a better investment in the pieces that we purchase and be more thoughtful about them. Um, and also maybe be more thoughtful about resourcing things that are, you know, have already been used either secondhand or um, circulated. And so, I think there's a real opportunity for people to pause and rethink their closets at this point. Um, and I, I just think it's a great opportunity for us to, to do that and for us as brands to be part of that conversation. Yeah, yeah, I, I add to that, that while it has been, of course, massively disruptive to our industry and to our brands, uh, I think we are starting to see consumers respond in a different way. And the things that are 
uh, sticking and uh, where we see sort of a, a steady pulse is on our programs that relate to sustainability. I think it is giving people a reason to take a step back and say, okay, what is really essential to me? How can I be more in line with my values? So I think that's maybe some good news to, to, to end on is that um, uh, our, our programs that are aligned with sustainability seem to be doing pretty well. Absolutely. Definitely a great place to wrap up. And um, I want to thank each of the three of you for sharing your perspective today. Um, I know we have a, a ton of great additional questions in the comments and we'll try to reach out to folks. Um,